Hello, Kerbal Nauts, and welcome to... Whoa, wait a minute, this isn't Kerbal Space Program. No, in fact, this is Eyes on the Solar System by NASA. It's in beta, but it's actually a 3D visualization tool. It can show you the positions of the planets. It can show you the positions of its missions, like Juno spacecraft. If I double-click on that, it'll zoom me in and actually show me an image of the spacecraft as well as its exact position within the solar system. But that's not the one I want to look at. If I go back to there and bring up the toolbar. By the way, this is free to download and use. All you need is an internet connection to get all the data. And what I want to look at is the new horizons. So if I click on feature right here, it should zoom me in to the new horizon spacecraft. A New Horizon spacecraft was launched in 2006 yonks ago, over nine years ago, and it was on its way to Pluto. Now this will be the first spacecraft to, to be sent to Pluto, it's the only spacecraft that has been sent to Pluto. I don't think we're going to have any others, so if I click on free control so I can view it. Right, New Horizons is actually, this is what it's doing right now at the time I'm recording this which is 17 hours until encounter. It's pointing at Pluto, taking photographs. It has four tools on it. One's called LORI, Long Range Reconnaissance Imager, telescopic camera so we can see where it's going. Then it's got Ralph, Visible Infrared Imager and Spectrometer. It look at the light, color and thermal maps. It can work out, you know, through using the spectroscopy, what things are made of. Then you have the ultraviolet imaging spectrometer, which also analyzes, especially analyzes the composition and structure of Pluto's atmospheres, and any other Cupiter belts, uh, Cupiter objects in the Cupiter belt, which is the sort of belt, where it's sort of like an asteroid belt surrounding the entire solar system. It's a leftovers from the creation of the solar system, really. And then you have Rex. Radio science experiment. Measure the atmospheric composition and temperature. And it's a Paso radiometer, wherever that is. I'm not going to pretend I know everything on that. I have to read it all up. I haven't at the moment. Because I'm more interested on what we're going to find. Right, this was launched up in 2006 on an Atlas. It was an Atlas rocket? I think so. And it's, since then, it's been traveling for. A uh, well over seven, well, well over nine years towards Pluto. So hopefully everything will work. Let's do a live preview of what's going to happen. This is exactly what NASA want to have happen. They want to come close to Pluto. They want to take pictures, scan everything. All this is pre-programmed. You can see as well the dish, the antenna dish of the spacecraft, normally isn't pointing at Earth while it's doing its observations. So that means we will not receive the data. Now it's transmitting the data back after the encounter. And the reason for that is because they can't move the dish about because they don't have the power. They couldn't put solar panels on it because it was so far away from the sun. So they put a radio isotope generator which creates heat and creates electricity from that heat and powers the spacecraft, which is only enough to power two 100 watt light bulbs. So it generates 200 watts. And that's enough to maneuver the spacecraft, get it to point in the right direction, and take the science, and then transmit it back to Earth. Also, they're worried about dust. Apparently, they think some of these moons were created from collisions between the, perhaps Pluto and Charon, which is its largest moon. By the way, Charon is half the size of Pluto, so they both orbit on a center of gravity, which is not exactly in Pluto, so they look like they're both wobbling. And anyway, they con they're concerned that the dust will hit the spacecraft, and the way to protect it, if we rewind time again to when it was passing by, you can see the dish is pointing the direction that it's traveling. And that is so that the dish can help protect it from the micrometeorites that might be around Pluto, left from the remnants of any impacts. 
we're not entirely sure what it's you know what the problems we're gonna have all the science has to be pre-programmed so you see they got three instruments scanning Pluto by here and they're hoping that Pluto will be in the precise position because the Pluto spacecraft can't exactly find out where it's going to point it can't look and say oh there's a planet no it has to be pre-programmed and the scientists and engineers are hoping that they're going to be pointing in the right direction at the right time so it all has to be precision programmed and it has to be done weeks ahead so if they have to adjust anything now it's too late because it takes a couple of hours or is it 20 odd minutes to transmit that out i should have found that out before recording this anyway i want to recreate this mission on Kerbal space program so let's go ahead and do it Okay guys, this is what I built to represent the New Horizons spacecraft, or the New Horizons, New Kerbal Horizons spacecraft, perhaps. Anyway, I used the rover body as the main body of the spacecraft, a per radio isotope generator on there, the large satellite antenna, some batteries, some goo canisters, heat shields, and even a small thruster and some fuel tanks, just so I can do some course corrections. Right, let's put this on a rocket and launch it up. And here is the new Kerbal Horizon spacecraft on its way to Pluto, or in our case, ELO, which is the analogue of Pluto. It has four stages of awesome power to get it into orbit. And without delay, let's go, because I fast forward time to go and for the correct intercept angle with ELO, and we need to get there as fast as possible. At least get up into orbit, otherwise we'll miss our transfer window. Anyway, fast forwarding through the launch sequence, we've got four rocket boosters which will momentarily decouple, and then we will be left with the mainsail engine which will get us into orbit. Now note I put wing winglets on this rocket, they weren't on the original Atlas V rocket which launched the New Horizons spacecraft up, but I was having stability issues so and that is why I added the winglets on there. So unfortunately, they will stay. Anyway, what we'll have to do now is get up into orbit, then create a maneuver node which will get us to ELU, which presents its own problems. Pluto itself presents problems to mission controllers as it's on an inclined orbit, and it is quite far away which I will show you when we do our transfer operations. But right now we need to get into orbit, so the main stage is away, and we're now on our third stage, which will boost ourselves into orbit and do a partial boost towards our target. We will go to our fourth stage, our transfer stage. Okay, so now we're in the map. Let's have a look, our rendezvous. We have an intercept angle of four, percent, four degrees, and right now I'm zooming out and I'm looking at which direction the Kerbin is traveling. Right, it's Elu is off there in the distance, there. Kerbin is traveling in this direction and what you want to do is go at a 45 degree angle to the right. Create a maneuver node. This will give you the best position for boosting out of Kerbin orbit and using the gravity of Kerbin to boost yourself into a higher orbit. Right, note this, this will be slightly different to the actual New Horizons launch because New Horizons used Jupiter as a gravity boost as well. But let's go to the problems that they had as well as us. Well, our problem is that we have to do an inclination burn. And you'll see doing an inclination burn give, alters our orbit quite a bit. Right, so we have to reduce that down. And once you reduce that down, that reduces our inclination. So it's a bit of juggling with your boosting, your retrograde, and your inclination change. But eventually, if it is shown on here, we do get a close approach. You can see it flashing up here, and that is what we're going to stick with. At least I twiggle it a bit more till we get a closer approach. And what we'll do is a correction burn. OK, 
Okay, so one thing Nasser faced as well as the problems of inclination and the burn and doing a flyby of Jupiter was they did not know the exact position that Pluto would be when they launched the spacecraft. They know the rough position and that's why they were able to get the closer approach as we did by here. But what they were lacking was the information was where Pluto will be exactly where, do they have to point their cameras? And the problem was that they didn't have enough data. Pluto takes about 247 years to orbit the Sun. That means it hasn't orbited in one complete orbit since its discovery, and it won't even do so during a human's lifetime. So it's something we didn't know much about. And it was something the scientists had to grapple with while the probe was on its way to Pluto. And the way they went around this, they found some old notes, old photograph plates, of ranging from about 20 years, and they used that to plot the exact course of Pluto so they can plot the exact course of their space program, and their space probe, New Horizons. Okay, so now that we're armed with that information, we know where ELO is going to be, or Pluto, whichever one you would call it, we can now go ahead on that way. But first off, we do have to do some course corrections, because even NASA, when they burn, they're not going to have exact burn. They're going to have some problems, they're going to be slightly out. So what NASA does is something called Trajectory Correction Maneuver, or TCMs. I'm going to create one by here. This is going to do one for our initial flyby, and then we'll do one further on to get our proper encounter. I checked on the Pluto New Horizons spacecraft website, and they had done about nine correction burns. We're only doing about two for getting our encounter. And now we have our closest approach, we have our encounter. We can do these two maneuvers and head on our way. And we don't have to wait nine years to do this. We can use time acceleration. Well, you can see how fast time acceleration is in this game, especially on long distance journeys. We're heading towards our second maneuver node, and it is literally taking us two years. Not literally, but in game time, it's taking us two years. In real life, you can see it's still slowly coming towards our next maneuver. It's going to take a couple of minutes to get there. So through the magic of further editing time acceleration, we shall get there faster. Okay, so this is our last correction burn, and actually this is the third one we've done on the mission. I messed up on the last one, slightly burnt a bit off, and see the trajectory have to change by here. It's going to take over 3000 meters per second in total. And I have to admit, I used a cheat, I used infinite fuel for this one to get this into play, because otherwise I would not be able to do the flyby. And you can see here, I used hyper edit to put some asteroids around ELO, I even <laughs> tricked Minmas to orbit ELO instead of curving. And that is that big body you can see under there. I'll show you that now when we go to our encounter. But once the burn has complete, been complete, and now we're heading for our encounter, you see we only have four hours to the complete encounter. We only have four hours within the Pluto system, and that does not leave us much time to do observations and science, which normally take months. The more science you get, the more information you can collect, the better your science will be. So they have to do everything in a fleeting moment. You can see the flyby itself is so fast. They have to make sure that everything is pointing in the right direction. The dish is pointing towards the direction they're heading, making sure that micrometeorites aren't going to damage the internals of the spacecraft. And also they have to point the camera towards Pluto and its moons, including Sharon and all the other ones which the names escape me at the moment. But all this is done, in, although it seems quite slow here, and you'd think, oh, you can get a lot done here. This probe has to do all its science on its own, without any human intervention. Not just because of the time it takes for the signal to transverse across towards Pluto, but also because the dish can't point towards Earth while it's traveling. So it's only after the point, 
after it's done all its observations, that hopefully all the data can be transmitted back. Okay, we've got a bit here, potential that the probe is scanning all the moons, getting all the science it can because you can't move the spacecraft while you're in time acceleration. And then the probe is going to reorientate itself, point towards the sun, hopefully where Earth is, and say, hi. <laughs> so long, suckers, <laughs> probably that's what I was going to say. Uh, but anyway, and that is my recreation of the Pluto. It would have been a fail if I didn't use cheats like infinite fuel. But that's not the end of the mission. No, the New Horizon spacecraft will go on further. They've already picked some targets that are out there in the Jupiter belt. They're going to observe them as well. It's going to be a lot less light out there though than that Pluto is the one that they're most interested in because it is once known as a planet, is demoted to a dwarf planet when all the other Kupta belts were discovered. But that is another story. Whether you want to call it a planet or not, this is history in the making. I'm Orbator. If you enjoyed this video, hit that like button. If you want more like this, subscribe and I'll do some more. Trust me, I'm an engineer.